So let's just illustrate the concepts. For this cipher, we have a 5-bit plain text block coming in, a 5-bit plain te cipher text block coming out, and a 3-bit key. So we could draw that, just draw it up the top saying that our simple cipher, can someone give it a name? Give our cipher a name. Bob, okay. Plain text comes in, and our cipher, I need some space, sorry. Bob, that's the name of our cipher, it's not des, it takes a key in. and produces ciphertext that comes out. The length of those, in our case, are 5 bits. The key is 3 bits. And the ciphertext is 5 bits. That's the single version of our cipher, Bob. That's the normal operation. From the perspective of a brute force attack, What's the worst case time to break Bob? So we do a brute force. What's the worst case number of operations I need to break this? Eight. Why eight? 2 to the power of 3. Our, our key is 3 bits. We have 8 possible values. 2 to the power of 3 possible values. What if I replace Bob with Des? I'll not draw it, but let's say we, we just cha change the algorithm. Do you remember the key length or the effective key length in, in DES? The effective key length? 56. So the actual key that you choose is 64 bits, but eight or eight of the bits are unused in encryption. So we'll, we'll say 56 bits here, because in practice, the, brute, the attacker needs to try and find those 56 bits only. So with 56 bits, with DES, a brute force, worst case, 2 to the power of 56. That's a 6. We'll just keep track of both of them. We'll go through the simple example and compare. So that's the normal case. Of course, our simple cipher is, is subject to a brute force attack. And in fact, DES today is considered subject to a brute force attack. 56 bits is not long enough. So the concept of a double cipher, double encryption, We take our plain text in, we apply our cipher, we use one key to encrypt that, we'll get a value that comes out, we'll denote as x, some intermediate value, and then we take that, encrypt that again. but this time using a different key. Same cipher, different key, and get ciphertext out. Still same lengths for our simple cipher Bob. Five bits of plain text. X value will also be five bits. C is five bits. The keys each are three bits. So just apply the cipher twice. Note, if we take a plain text, we get some x that comes out. x should be random with respect to the plain text. That's the idea of the encryption. That is, we'll get a different value out. Then we encrypt that different value. We should get another random value output. So we'll get a secure cipher text. Now we use two different keys. The chooser chooses those two keys. So if Effectively, the user chooses a 6-bit key. They choose a 6-bit random value. 
the first three bits will be used for the first step, the second three bits used for the second step. Let's call this double bob. We've applied bob twice. Brute force. What's a brute force attack on double bob take? <coughs> Two to the power of six operations. Again, the attacker has to guess both values of K1 and K2 if they want to do a brute force. So six bits to guess. Two to the power of six operations. Similar with double deaths. How many bits? Well, we expand our key from 56 up to 112 bits. We just use two different keys, or two random keys. With double deaths, a brute force will take 2 to the power of 112 operations. And if you look up, if you go back to that table we gave some example times for brute force attacks, you'll see that with computers today that's probably not possible. Okay? If we try to do calculations of how fast computers are, if you had thousands of computers, it's still going to take many years to do a brute force attack. So that's the idea, make a brute force attack not possible. Let's see why we can try a different attack to still defeat double deaths. And the attack is called meet in the middle. What we will do, we will assume that the attacker has a pair of plain text ciphertext. That is, this attack requires the attacker to have a little bit of extra information to work. The assumption is that the attacker knows from some past encryption by the user, they know a plain text and the corresponding ciphertext. So knowing a ciphertext is easy. Intercept and you learn the ciphertext. But we also assume that they know what was the plain text for that case. They don't know the key, but they know one pair of plain text ciphertext where the ciphertext was obtained using the Bob encryption algorithm using the, some secret key, K1 and K2. We want to find K1 and K2. How can our user or our attacker know a pair of ciphertext and plaintext without knowing the key? What we need is somehow that, let's say, we've, we can learn ciphertext easy, intercept. How do we learn the plaintext? Well, the idea of encryption is we can't learn the plaintext if we don't have the key. We don't have the key. How can we assume that the attacker knows the plaintext? Well, it may be some, in some cases possible. Sometimes the ciphertext is encrypted and it only needs to stay encrypted for a certain period of time. Maybe the plaintext is released publicly later. Okay, so let's say I encrypt a message I send it, the ciphertext to someone. The message only makes sense for one day. After two days, it doesn't matter if someone knows what the plaintext message is. So the attacker may discover ah, this old ciphertext corresponds with this plaintext value. Uh, a, a simple example of that. Let's say the plaintext message is the coordinates of where uh, the military is going to bomb someplace. Okay, so the headquarters of the military send the exact GPS coordinates. You need to bomb this location. They send it to the plane that's going to bomb them, and they bomb that location. The attacker, of course, they don't send the coordinates in plain text. They send them encrypted so that if someone intercepts, they can't learn where they're going to bomb that location. So the attacker sees the ciphertext. They can't find the plain text. Fine. But tomorrow after they know that that location was bombed, they know the ciphertext and they know the coordinates of where it was bombed because it was actually bombed. 
So now they know the corresponding plain text with that ciphertext. Because that information was only really valid for up until the, the time that the bomb was hit the ground. So that's an extreme example, but there's other cases where it's possible for the attacker to learn the plain text, even if they don't have the key. So let's assume that they do. And I'll give you a pair. Let's We'll use our table to do the encryption, our meet in the middle attack. This attack assumes that the attacker knows a, a plain text ciphertext pair. And I'll give you one. And in fact, in practice, when we apply this attack to real deaths, it's usually not just one pair that they have to know. They may need to know a, a set of pairs, okay, more than one. And at the end, we'll analyze and see, well, how many? Let's give you a second one, just in case we need it. This is known by the attacker, another pair. What that means is that the attacker knows that when P1 is encrypted, we get C1. When we use keys K1 and K2, but we don't know the keys K1 and K2. The goal of the attack is to find the keys K1 and K2. They also know using those same two key values, encrypting the value of P2 gives C2. So this is learnt by the attacker in advance. They need this to be successful. Given that, now they start the meet in the middle attack. <coughs> and it's quite simple. What they do, given one of the pairs that they know, say with the first pair, they take the plain text, P1, and they do a brute force on that plain text using the single version of the cipher, Bob and find all possible potential values that come out of that. That is, what they're going to do in the picture is they know P1. They're going to encrypt P1 with every possible key. They don't know K1, so let's try all possible values. We'll get multiple values of X coming out, potential values. Not necessarily the correct one, but possible values. And we'll store them. And then what we'll do is we'll take the known ciphertext, C1, and go backwards. That is, we know what C1 is, we know what P1 was that we started with, we don't know K1 or K2. After we try for all possible values of K1 on P, we get potential values of X. Then, with the ciphertext C1, we decrypt that with possible values of K2. And the idea is that if we know that P1 produced C1 as output, if you encrypt P1 with the correct key, you'll get some X value. And if you decrypt C1 with the correct key, you'll get the same X value. It must be the same because otherwise they wouldn't have produced that correct pair. So what we do is once we know the potential values of the X in one direction, we work backwards and see if we find a matching X from the ciphertext. If we do, then that's a potential key pair. If it's not a match, then it's definitely not the correct key. So we'll try that. The first step, a brute force attack on P1 
using our cipher Bob and the key K1 is 3 bits so we need to try 8 possible keys so the meat in the middle attack we're going to start with P1 and encrypt with the 8 possible keys I'll list them, we know what they are and we're going to get eight intermediate values of X so look up in the table given plain text 01101 key 000 what comes out for our cipher Bob let's simply look up in the table write it down and then do it for the other keys so we need to try it for all possible keys here this is a brute force on the single version of our cipher quick won't take long to find the answer. Eight values of X. How do they know the plain text? We said an example. There are some examples where the, the cipher text is known, and because the message was only secret for a short period of time, then maybe the plain text is released later. Maybe the plain text was a message to say. Uh, um, buy uh, buy these stocks in this in Apple. All right, buy a, a thousand shares of a Apple at this time at this price. That was encrypted. Once they are bought, the next day, then it's no longer to stay encrypted because if someone sees that you've bought them after you've already bought them, you may not want to keep them secret. You want to keep it secret before you buy them, so that someone doesn't know you're going to purchase stocks, for example. So some information, the plain text, is only need to be secret for a short period of time. If that's the case, then the attacker may discover that plain text. What do you get? Write down your values. Good. Look up your table and find out the values of X, which is just the ciphertext that comes out of our bit block cipher. eight keys what was our plain text zero one one zero one zero one one here's our plain text encrypt with the first key and we get this value as output the second key the, the next column and so on so we just get these eight values as output here Let's write them down. And I'll give them values. I'll say it's x, the first value of x, 1, 1. We'll get these eight potential values of X.
this we'll call x18. Keep track of how many operations we do, because at the end we need to count how many operations do we do in total or in a typical case and compare it to brute force attack. Here we've encrypted our, our plain text eight times, so the number of operations is eight or two to the power of three, it depends upon the key length here. Now we get these eight values, we store them in memory, so we have to save them. And then the next step is that with the corresponding ciphertext, C1, we decrypt that with potential key values. We know C1, each, it was given to us, five ones. So decrypt with the potential keys, see what we get. This was x1, we're going to get another x value here, x2. What we do is we take this ciphertext, decrypt with our first possible key, we don't know what the value of the key is, we try this one, what do we get? Look up the table, five ones decrypted with key zero zero zero. We did it before, so decrypt those values as you go. Find the the cipher on page 107 and decrypt the value 1111 with the key 00. What do we get for the first? value of x. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. We did that before. Let's just check that. The key was three zeros. The ciphertext, five ones, which is here. Decrypt this and you get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then we do that for the next key. This is the, the x value, x21 will denote it as. And you keep, keep going with the other keys. You'll, t you'll tell me if we, I write down any errors. This is our last value. So the first stage, encrypt the plain text with all possible keys. The second stage, take the corresponding known ciphertext for that plain text that we started with, C1, and decrypt that with 
what we did with all possible keys. We'll come back later and sometimes we may not need to do all possible keys in the second phase, but we'll do that. So in our block model, what we did, P1 encrypted with eight keys, get potential values of x, x1, so x11, x12, up to x18. With C1, decrypt with all possible keys, K2, and get X2, X21, X22, and so on. And we know if we've got the correct K1 and K2, then the X values should match. X1 should equal X2. Because we know that X is the intermediate value when we encrypt to get the ciphertext. So this tells us what are the potential values of K1 and K2. And it's quite easy to see. We look at the values where the X are the same on both sides. Does this value, X11, match any of these? Find, see if you can find this value in this set. Actually, we'll do it the other way. We'll try with X2 first, because that's what's done in practice. Does 10001 appear in the first set of X values? No, it's not there. Okay, so the next value. Does this appear in the first set? Check carefully. No, it's not there. The third one? No. Fourth one? Are we unlucky today? Fifth one? Yes, that's there somewhere. There's a match there. We know that if we've used the right keys of K1 and K2, when do, the potential values of K1 are those that we used when we obtained X1, and the potential values of K2 are those values of the key we used when we obtained X2. So we know if we've used the correct values of, X, of K1 and K2, the X values must match. Here we find a match. Any other matches? Which ones? The last value of x2 matches matches two different places. And that's possible. Okay. All the others don't match, which means that the potential values of K1 and K2, well, there are three potential values, three pairs. K1 could be the value we use to get X12, 001, and K2 could be the value we use to get X25, which was 100. So that's a potential key pair. We're actually looking for the, the, the entire six bits, but I'll write it down as a, key, a pair of keys, K1, K2, we're trying to find. The first potential values are 001 and 100. But there's other potential values, 011 with 111. And the last one, 100, 111. So the attacker now knows that the keys used by the, the user are one of those three pairs. We want to know exactly which one. How do we find out? <coughs> Try print a new message? Well, in fact, I gave you a, a second one because I knew that's what we would need here. If the attacker has a second plain text ciphertext pair, like the one given here, they can check which of those three potential key values 
if we take our plain text to 11001, encrypt with potential value of K1, you get X, encrypt that with a potential value of K2, if you get this ciphertext value, then you're very confident that it's the correct one. Maybe not for sure. If you don't get it, you know it's not the correct key. Try. See which of the these three potential values are correct. Or which are incorrect. If there's only one left over, that's the, the correct value. That is encrypt P2 with K1 and K2 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And the next potential value. Try. It's useful to look up. Start with 11001P2. And we'll try this first potential values of the keys. If we use K1 as 001, what does the value of X become? Encrypt this value of the plain text with this key. What's X? If you look up in the table, all zeros, five zeros. Good. Now take that X value and encrypt it with the value of K2. One, one. What's K2 is the other value in the pair. We're using this pair first. We'll try that. And when we do that, we get ciphertexts and 11011. Does that match the expected value of ciphertext? Yes, it does. So this key pair that we just tried is a potential correct key pair. We don't know for sure. Maybe there's still others that are also potentially correct. One way to find out is to try the others. So do the same with the second key pair. Zero, one, one. Get a value of x. And then the second one, three ones. And to be complete, we'll try with the, the last one. All we're doing here is encrypting using our lookup table. Using the table of the 5-bit block cipher, we know the plain text in, we know the key, find the output, and then take that as the plain text in the next step. With the key, find the output and see what you get. And then check whether the ciphertext values you get out match the known correct value. The known correct value was given in our pair. We know C2 should be this value. Well, we got it here. Here we get 10111 out. We try key 111. And you get 10100 out. This is the wrong key pair. We know for sure now that this key pair is not the correct one. 
because it doesn't give us the right ciphertext value. And we try the last one. And we get a ciphertext value that also doesn't match, and that gets us to the end. We now, of those three potential key pairs of K1 and K2, we tried them all using our second known plaintext ciphertext pair, and we found that two of them don't work. Only one of them works, and that tells us that the correct values of K1 and K2 are the first pair. K1 is 0, 0, 001, and K2 is 1, 0, 0. That's the answer. We've found the key for the, the double version of our cipher Bob. Count the number of operations we did with a single version of Bob. How many encrypts or decrypts did we do? Count them. In the first phase, we did a brute force attack on the key. We did eight operations, two to the power of three. The next phase, we actually did another eight operations, this time decrypt. But generally, with ciphers, encrypt and decrypt take about the same time with block ciphers. So we count them as another eight operations. So we've got 16 operations. And then in the last set of checks, we did one, two, three, four, five, six, another six operations, another six encrypts or decrypts, just to check those three pairs. So a total of 22 operations in this case. We have to do these eight. We have to do a brute force here, two to the power of three. We did it again, but going backwards, another 2 to the power of 3. And in this case, we had three potential pairs, so we need to do another 6 to check. We won't always get three potential pairs. Sometimes we'll get just one, and therefore we don't need to check. We've already found the correct key. Sometimes we'll get more than one, so we will need to check. So the main... Con contribution to the number of operations is doing the first two steps. We have to do the brute force here, 2 to the power of 3 always. What we can do when we look at the real desk is that we don't ne even need to do all 2 to the power of 3 here sometimes. What we may do is if we find, let's say in this case, if we found uh, the first matching pair after five operations, then check that with a, another pair, and the probabilities work when you have a large number of keys, like DES, when there's many possible values, the probability that the key pair that we find works for two or even three plain text ciphertext pairs is very, very low if it's incorrect. That is, if we find a match, very high chance we've got the correct one. Here, because there's only eight to choose from, it's possible to get different possible values, but with DES, the chance of getting multiple and then doing it again and getting multiple is very, very low. So we can actually cut down the number of operations by stopping once we find a correct pair. Even if you do them all, 2 to the power of 3 plus 2 to the power of 3 plus another 6 here. So we've got 2 to the power of 3 two times at least. This meet in the middle attack. Let's write down some of the numbers. To compare with brute force.
on our version of double bob. In that case, it took us 2 to the power of 3 plus another 2 to the power of 3 plus, in our case, another 6. Twenty-two in that case. Our brute force on double bob would have took thirty-two. Right. So we've done better than doing a brute force attack. Brute force try all thirty-two keys. Two to the power of six. Sixty-four. Well done. Two to the power of five is thirty-two. Even better. Brute force requires two to the power of six operation 64 operations we did it in 22 so we yep. only check at the end if the cyber is correct we only checked when we have multiple potential values of the key like in this case we had three potential values so we did 2 to the power of 3 we did another 2 to the power of 3 operations now we have three possible values so we check those three only another six operations. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's summarize the numbers. So with a brute force on double bob, it would have took 64 operations. Here, meet in the middle, in our specific case, took 22. We're about a, three times faster than a brute force attack, a third of the, the number of operations. So that's good. That's where this attack is better than brute force because we can find the key in less time. In double deaths, we must do a brute force attack on the single version. So there's 2 to the power of 56. And then, worst case, we need to do another 2 to the power of 56. Similar here, we did 2 to the power of 3 of in encrypts from one direction, 2 to the power of 3 of decrypts from the other direction. So we do two brute force attacks, plus some others. In the same here, we had plus 6. How many do we plus here depends upon how many matches we get. Here we had six, there were three matches. If we have a thousand matches here, we have plus two thousand. But compared to two to the power of fifty-six, two to the power of fifty-six is billions and billions. So the number that we plus on in the end is, in most cases, almost zero. So small. Plus something. Which is approximately, if this is very small compared to 2 to the power of 56. What do we get? If this is 0, so 2 to the power of 56 plus 2 to the power of 56, 2 to the power of 57. 2 times 2 to the power of 56. Brute force on single deaths takes 2 to the power of 56 operations. Brute force on double deaths takes 2 to the power of 112 operations. Brute, a meet in the middle attack on double deaths takes about 2 to the power of 57 operations. It's about two times slower than breaking single deaths. In other words, if you can break single deaths in one day, you can break double deaths, use a meet, meet in the middle attack in two days, okay? which is insignificant from the attacker's perspective. All right? If I can break something in one day, then if I want to break double deaths in, two, in one day as well, I just spend twice as much money on my computers. So that's why well, we say that the double deaths is not much more secure than single deaths. It's about the same, two times better. So that's why double deaths or double encryption in general, it's not just for deaths, double encryption like this is not a good approach. It doesn't help, or it doesn't help by much. 
So the meet in the middle attack means that we shouldn't just do double encryption to extend the key length. You can try triple encryption, one then another then another, and it turns out that that does make it harder for the attack and because you can't go back from either endpoints because there's two x values in the middle. So first let's summarize on meet in the middle attack. In terms of number of operations, what we do, a brute force on the first key value, k1, and then a brute force on the second key value, so equivalent to two brute force attacks, and then possibly a few other operations just to check, but usually a very small number compared to a brute force attack. So it takes about two times uh, as time to break as a brute force attack on deaths using a meet in, in the middle attack. Now there's some ways to improve that. The brute force attack on K2, again with deaths, you usually don't have to try all 2 to the power of 56 because as soon as you find a match you can confirm that match with another pair and you uh, very high probability that you've got the correct key pair. So in fact usually it's closer to just 2 to the power of 56 here. Coming back to our specific example, what's the problem with our meet in the middle attack from the attacker's perspective? What do we need to know or what do we need to do to make this attack work? We, we know that the user hasn't changed his key, so, so that's okay. We assume that the attacker, the, the normal user, is using the same key for every plain text that they encrypt. We'll come back to that later. A good policy, therefore, is to change your key. But here they're using the same key. What's the problem from the attacker's perspective? For this tool, the attacker needed to know a pair of plain text ciphertext. They had needed to know two in our case. So there's one issue. Somehow they must discover this plain text ciphertext pair in advance. So this attack depends upon the attacker knowing some information in advance. So that's one limitation. Another, maybe more practical limitation is that when they do first brute force on K1, they get these eight values of x. What they must do is they store those eight values because when they're doing the next brute force, they compare the generator value of x2 with those eight values of x1. Go through and check, see which one's matched. And if you do get a match, you've got a potential key pair. With deaths, the number of x values, how many? X1, how many do we need to store? With Bob, we stored 2 to the power of 3 values of X1, that first column. With Des, we'd have 2 to the power of 56 values of X1. So with Des, we'd need to store 2 to the power of 56 values of X1. Then when we go through to find X2, we compare with those 2 to the power of 56 values. Next one, compare and find the possible matches. The limitation here is the storage. 2 to the power of 56 values. How many bytes? Store 2 to the power of 56 in deaths, how big would x be? In our cipher, x was 5 bits, a 5-bit block. In deaths, it uses a 64-bit block. 2 to the power of 56, 64-bit blocks. We need to store them on disk or in memory. Sixty-four bits is eight bytes times 
2 to the power of 56. That's the number of bytes that we need. Megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes. Only 576,000 terabytes. Okay. What's above terabytes? Petabytes, isn't it? P, I think, above T. But a hard disk we measure in terabytes, so we need about half a million hard disks. All right, of one gigabyte, one terabyte hard disk to store this information in an attack. So here's a practical limitation of the meat in the middle attack. You need a lot of storage space to store that first set of answers and then compare against them. Approximately And we must know multiple, usually multiple, plain text, ciphertext pairs. So for the attack to be successful, the number of operations is twice as many as a single desk brute force attack. But we must store a lot of information to do the attack, and we must know multiple plain text, ciphertext pairs in advance to be successful. Even though that storage space may be considered not practical today. Uh, there may be ways to reduce it or to cut down on how much we store and this is the, the double deaths is not considered a good design because of the meet in the middle attack. And this was known and people therefore designed triple deaths. Encrypt, encrypt, encrypt three times and you can't take the plain text and the ciphertext and go back to get the same point. So you can't meet in the middle in that case. So triple death is considered secure. <laughs>